أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 223 سورة الأحزاب آية number 49 to 52 يا أيها الذين آمنوا O you who have believed إذا نكحتم المؤمنات When you marry believing women ثم طلقتموهن And then you divorce them When من قبل أن تمسوهن Before you touch them Meaning before you have any physical contact with them فَمَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ عِدَّةِ Then there is not for you any waiting period to count concerning them But what should you do at the time of divorce? فَمَتِّعُوهُنَّ وَسَرِّحُوهُنَّ صَرَاحًا جَمِيلًا But provide for them and give them a gracious release When you're sending them away, send them in an honorable manner In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing who? The believers. And what is the ayah about? Divorce. So what does this show to us? The address, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu. This is a reminder that following this command, observing this command is something that is a requirement of iman. That if you're believers, then you have to observe this. Your iman requires you to do this. And when you will observe this, then what's going to happen? It will be a means of strengthening your iman. And if you neglect this in any way, this is a sign of weakness of iman. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ When you marry the believing women. The word nakahtum is from noon kafha. And what does nikah mean? Literally, it means الضم, الجمع To join two things together. This is the literal meaning of the word nikah. And what does nikah do? A marriage contract. It joins two individuals together in a relationship. They had absolutely no connection before, no relationship before. And now because of the nikah, they are joined to one another. They are connected to one another. They have a relationship. Whereas right before the nikah, they were non mahram to one another. Isn't it so? And the word nikah is used in two ways. First of all, it is used for sexual relationship. And secondly, it is also used for marriage contract. Two things the word nikah is used for. However, in the Qur'an, the word nikah is only used for marriage contract. The word nikah is only used for marriage contract. So, إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Nikah over here, what does it mean? When you have... Married them, meaning when you have had the contract only. Over here, it refers to only the aqt, only the contract. And we learn in the Qur'an, at various places where the word nikah has been used, it refers to the contract. Like for instance, وَلَا تَنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنْ Don't get married to them. Similarly, الزَّانِي لَا يَنْكِحُ إِلَّا زَانِيَةً أَوْ مُشْرِكَةً Over there also nikah means the contract. Then in the case where a man, if he divorces his wife three times, فَإِن طَلَّقَهَا فَلَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدُ حَتَّى تَنْكِحَ زَوْجٍ غَيْرَ So over there also nikah means contract. Alright? So, إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ When you have married the believing women. Now we have learned earlier that Muslim men, they are allowed to marry believing women and who else? The women from the Ahlul Kitab. But over here only mu'minat are mentioned. You understand? You understand the question, the point that I'm making over here? That only mu'minat are mentioned over here, whereas a Muslim man is allowed to marry who? A Muslim woman as well as a kitabi woman. So why are mu'minat mentioned over here? For two reasons. First of all, because this ruling only applies when a man gets married to a believing woman. If he gets married to a kitabi woman, then this ruling does not apply. The ruling that is given in the ayah, that's not relevant in that situation then. In that case then. So it's only applicable in the case where a man marries a mu'mina woman. And secondly, believing women are only mentioned over here because mu'minat are being mentioned over here as opposed to mushrikat. Remember that marriage to mushrikat, mushrik women, is forbidden. Isn't it so? So mu'minat, believing women when you get married to. And although marriage with kitabi women is permissible, 
However, it is still preferable that a person gets married to who? A mu'mina. You understand? Why mu'minat are mentioned? Because it is preferable that a Muslim man gets married to her. Because a person who has iman, then what quality will he look for? He will look for iman. Isn't it so? And if a person is interested in something else, then that's the quality that he's looking for. So, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu are being mentioned. So a person with iman, what will he prefer for himself? Iman. إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ When you have married believing women. ثُمَّ then. Meaning after the marriage contract, what happens? طَلَّقْتُمُهُنَّ You have divorced them. You got married, but you happen to divorce her. طَلَّقْتُمُ from طَلَاق And what does طَلَاق literally mean to? Let loose, to release. And literally the word طَلَاق is حَلُّ الْقَيْد What does قَيْد mean? قَيْد To imprison, to restrict, right? So حَلْ to release. Meaning to open up the imprisonment. You understand? To open up the lock, to let go, to let loose, to release, to set free. So, summa talaktumuhunna, when you have divorced them, min qabli, before, and tamasuhunna, before you touch them. Tamasuhunna, meem, seen, seen, mas. And mas literally means to touch. However, many times in the Quran, the word mas is figuratively used for what? Sexual contact between a husband and wife. And there are many other words that are used for this purpose as well, that figuratively it is hinted. Direct words are not used. Sometimes it is denoted by the word ifda, وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَى بَعْضُ Sometimes it is denoted by the word itian, itian is to come. Sometimes it is denoted by the word taghashi, to cover. And mas is also used. So min qabli an tamassuhunna mas over here means physical contact meaning sexual relationship between the husband and the wife. So you got married but you happened to divorce them before any sexual relationship. There was absolutely no physical contact. So in this case what's the ruling? Fama lakum then there is not for you. Meaning for you men you do not have to count alayhinna upon them Meaning, for them, concerning them, who? Concerning the women that you have divorced, min iddatin, any waiting period. Meaning, a woman who has been divorced before any marital relations were established between her and her husband, then she does not need to sit for any idda. You understand? There is no idda for that woman. Typically, what is the idda for a woman? In the case where she is divorced. Salatha tuquru. Remember? Three menstrual cycles. We learn this in the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, Ayah 228, that anfusihinna thalatha tuquru. That divorced women, they remain in waiting for how long? Three periods. Three menstrual cycles. And for a widow, a woman whose husband has died, how much is her idda? Four months and ten days. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 234. That, وَالَّذِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَعَشْرًا They have to wait with themselves for how long? Four months and ten days. Now, in an iddah, what is a woman supposed to do? What is a woman required to do in her iddah? What are the restrictions that are imposed on her? Okay, staying within the home. What else? Okay, she should refrain from beautifying herself. What else? Not accept any proposal, not get married. Remember that in idda a woman is not allowed to get married. So, فَمَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ idda. Such a woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that you don't have to count any idda for her. Not one month, not one day, not ten days, not four months, nothing. No waiting period whatsoever. So in this case, what's going to happen? If, let's say, the marriage contract took place, immediately she was divorced, can she get married the next hour? She can. 
Can she get married the next day? She can. Why? Because only the contract took place. That's it. There was absolutely no physical contact between the husband and the wife. And because of that, there was no attachment. You understand? And there was no chances of her being pregnant either. Because what is the objective of Iddah? What's the purpose behind the Iddah? Two reasons. What are they? First of all, to check if there is pregnancy. Right? Istibra'ur Rahm. That if she is pregnant, then it should be known. And secondly, like in the case where the widow, she has to sit for four months and ten days. Right? It's not three menstrual cycles. How much is it? Four months and ten days. Why is that so? To get over that relationship that she had with her husband. You understand? To get over that attachment. Because when a man and a woman have been in a relationship, emotionally they get attached to one another, especially the woman. So she needs time to get over it. However, we see that in this case, which is mentioned in this ayah, that a man and woman got married, there was absolutely no physical contact, they got divorced, no chances of pregnancy, and on top of that, no feelings of attachment either. Because there was no physical relationship. And because of that reason, she is allowed to get married soon after that. So what is mentioned over here? فَمَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ عِدَّةٍ تَعْتَدُّونَهَا تَعْتَدُّونَهَا That you count it. تَعْتَدُّونَ From the root letters عَيْن دَال دَال اِعْتِدَاد And what does that mean? To count, to number. So you do not have to count any idda. فَمَتِّعُهُنَّ But you should benefit them. Who should you benefit? The women whom you are divorcing. You got married to her. No physical contact, you divorced her. Now at the time of the divorce, you have to give her some kind of benefit. Matti'uhunna. Matti'uhunna, meem ta'ayn, mata' as you know, is used for benefit. Such benefit that is material, that is worldly, which is why it is also understood as temporary benefit. Because any worldly benefit, any material benefit, what is it? It's temporary. It's not eternal. It ends very soon. And matiruhunna over here would be in the case where no mahr has been fixed. Where no mahr has been fixed. We have learned this earlier as well. That if at the time of nikah the mahr was fixed hmm, and the woman was divorced before physical contact, then does she take the mahr with her? She takes half of what was fixed. You understand? When? In the case where the mahar was fixed. So let's say the man gave her $2,000. Now, after one hour, he realizes, no, no, wrong choice, wrong decision, divorce. Okay. But he said $2,000. Now, what is he supposed to do? Give her $1,000. He has to. Why? Because of the emotional injury that he caused her. Huh? And let's say there was no mahar that was fixed. You understand? One is that the mahar was fixed. The other is that mahar was not fixed at the time of nikah. Now in this case, matti'uhunna. It has been left open. You have to give them some kind of benefit. Some kind of benefit and this will be determined by what? By what the man can afford. You understand? This will be determined by how much ever the man can afford. And this matar can be anything. It could be money, it could be clothes, it could be jewelry. Anything that is of value and it will be determined by the financial ability of the man. We learn in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 236, that لا جناح عليكم إن طلقتم النساء ما لم تمسوهن أو تفرضوا لهن فريضة That there is no blame upon you if you divorce women you have not touched nor specified for them a mahr. You have not touched them and you have not even specified a mahar for them. But what are you supposed to do? وَمَتِّعُهُنَّ But give them a gift of compensation. And how much is it? عَلَى الْمُوسِعِ قَدَرُهُ وَعَلَى الْمُقْتِرِ قَدَرُهُ The wealthy according to his capability and the poor according to his capability. Each person is required to give according to how much he can afford. Whatever that he is able to give. And this Allah says, مَتَاعًا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ حَقًّا عَلَى الْمُحْسِنِينَ This is an obligation on who? 
on who? Those who do ihsan. So ihsan is being mentioned. That it's up to you how much ever you want to do, how much ever ihsan you want to do, give to the woman. And otherwise also, at the time of divorce, what is a man required to do? He must give some kind of mata to the woman. In the case where the mahar was fixed or it was not fixed, the marriage was consummated or not consummated, we see that the man is required to give some kind of mata to the woman at the time of divorce. And we learn that from where? From Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 241. That, وَلِلْمُطَلَّقَاتِ مَتَاعٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ حَقًّا عَلَى الْمُتَّقِينَ For all divorced women, any kind of divorced woman, for all of them, there is a provision according to what is acceptable, and this is a duty upon who? Those people who have taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says over here, فَمَتِّعُوهُنَّ Then give them something. وَسَرِّحُوهُنَّ And when you're releasing them, when you're sending them away, how should you send them? سَرَاحًا جَمِيلًا In a beautiful way. سَرِّحُوهُنَّ سِينْ رَاحًا تَسْرِيح What does تَسْرِيح mean? To let go of something. And تَسْرِيح is also used for divorce. So وَسَرِّحُوهُنَّ سَرَاحًا جَمِيلًا Set them free. Set them free in a manner that is beautiful. In a manner that is very decent. In a manner that is very gracious. What does it mean by that? Meaning without inflicting any harm upon her. Because typically at these times what happens? Both parties, they falsely accuse one another of things that have never been done. They speak very ill of one another. There is a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, a lot of insulting. But what do we see? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the men that was sarrihuhunna sarahan jamila. Send them away beautifully, gracefully, without any insult, without any beating or any fighting, any arguing. And also sarahan jamila that let her way open, meaning let her go. Don't prevent her. Don't hinder her. That just because you were in a contract with me, therefore you cannot get married to anybody else now. No. Sarahan jamila, let her go beautifully, graciously without imposing any restrictions on her, without making her life difficult. And one more thing that we learn from here is, وَسَرِّحُوهُنَّ سَرَاحًا jamila. That we see that the man and woman, they had no physical relationship yet. But still, the man is required to let her go beautifully. Now it's quite possible that both of them were living separately. You understand? That the nikah took place, the girl is still with her parents. She never moved in with the man. You understand? They were living separately. But still we see that the woman is under who? Under her husband. Even if she is living away from him. Even if there has been no physical contact. Which is why the men are being told, سَرِّحُهُنَّ Now let them go. Release them. سَرَاحًا jamila, In a beautiful manner. So what do we learn from this ayah? We learn many, many things. That first of all, we learn from this ayah about the importance of the issues concerning nikah and talaq. That they are not ordinary issues. They are not such matters that should be treated very casually. No. They are serious issues. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to divorce, both the parties should be extremely careful not to violate the rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. Where do we learn about this from? About the importance of these rulings. That, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu. The command is being given by what? Nida. They are being called. The believers are being addressed. And in this ayah, rulings concerning nikah and talaq. They are not ordinary rulings. They are not ordinary matters. They are serious matters. Because... Look at the detail with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining them. Look at the detail. And how many times has He mentioned them? In different, different ways. Different, different scenarios He has presented. What does it show to us? How important these matters are. That when it comes to these issues, we have to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do. Because many times in these situations, what do people follow? Their desires. Isn't it so? 
whatever they're being emotionally driven to do. They're angry, they'll not care about any rules. They're overcome by love, again they will not care about any rules. But we see that, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The believers are being addressed, Ya أَيُّهَا There's حَفْ نِدَى Which shows that these commands are extremely, extremely important. And a person must be very, very careful about them. Also we learn from the Sayyid, that observing the rules of the Sharia, the legal rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, whether they're about family law, about criminal law, business, any kind of laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, observing them is what? Is a part of Iman. Because remember, what is the definition of Iman? Tasdiq, qubul, and id'an, submission. So this is where submission comes in. That when you accept and acknowledge the fact that Allah is your Lord, then how are you to submit to Him? That whatever rulings He gives you, you accept them. You observe them. You follow them. And part of these rulings is also of nikah and talaq. And the stronger the iman of the person, the stronger his adherence to these commands. Remember that. The more careful he will be. And the weaker the iman, the weaker his adherence. He will not be careful then. So when a person's iman is strong, then what does he want to do? Do everything the way Allah wants him to do. It's an evidence of the strength of his iman. And if a person does not care about the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, then what does that show? Weakness of his faith. That he's not concerned about what Allah has said. Because it's only, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu who will be careful about this. Also we learn from the Sayyid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ طَلَّقْتُمُهُنَّ What comes first? Nikah. Then comes, then comes talaq. So this shows to us that there is no talaq before nikah. You're like, obviously. Right? There is no talaq before nikah. There are people who say, if I get married to so and so, I divorce her. From now. Meaning, I'm never gonna get married to her, and they say, if you want me to get married to her, I already divorce her. Or people say, that in tazawajtuki fa innaki taliq. That if I were to get married to you, then you are divorced already. And they think that because a man has said this statement with regards to a particular woman, if he gets married to her, then automatically there is talaq. No, there will be no talaq. You understand? Because sometimes people, they don't want to marry a particular person. And they say, if I get married to her, I divorce her. Now he has said this statement before, he actually got married. So when he gets married to her, there is no divorce. You understand? When he will get married to her, there is no divorce. Because he said those words when? Before even getting married. So those words have no meaning. When he gets married to her, and if he wishes to divorce her, then only can he give talaq. So there is no talaq before nikah. Alright? And words of divorce... Before nikah, what are they? Invalid. They're useless. They don't carry any meaning. They're not effective at all. And the Prophet ﷺ said that لا طلاق قبل نكاح. There is no divorce before marriage. Ibn Majah. Another hadith in Musnad Ahmad that لا طلاق لابن آدم فيما لا يملك. There is no divorce for the son of Adam with regards to which he does not possess. Meaning if he's not married to a particular woman, then he cannot divorce her. You understand? He cannot divorce her. Because sometimes people use these emotional ways to, you know, blackmail other people. Or to show that I'm never going to accept her as my wife. But the fact is that no matter what you say, it's irrelevant, it doesn't mean anything, unless and until there is a marriage contract. Also we learn from the Saya that about the permissibility of talaq. That it is permissible to give talaq. It is not haram. It is not something that should be looked down upon. Why? Because Allah has permitted it. Allah has allowed it. Because sometimes what happens? Just because a woman is divorced, just because a man is divorced, what happens? People treat them as if they're some other kind of creation. That 
there is absolutely no concept of thinking about getting them remarried thinking about proposing to them there is no such thought in some people but we see that when Allah has allowed talaq when it is permissible then who are we to object who are we to look down on people who have taken this option for whatever reason then we also learn from the saya about the permissibility of talaq of giving divorce before physical contact between the spouses that it is permissible to give talaq before the man and woman have had physical contact now what does it mean by mas masis what does it mean by that technically some scholars they understand masis mas as a technical term to be sexual intercourse and others say that no this applies to even khalwa what does khalwa mean being alone so if a man and woman were alone after nikah they just sat together that's it just exchanged a word or two no third person was there even if they didn't shake hands this is understood as masis this is understood as physical contact you understand there are two opinions one is that their sexual intercourse must have taken place secondly the other opinion is that even khalwa being alone is considered as masis okay both the opinions are there and we see that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once we see that he got married to a particular woman and when he went to her she said a'udhu billahi mink i seek refuge from you she didn't accept the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as her husband so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to her that you have sought refuge with one who is great so go home it's okay he sent her he divorced her immediately and he said go and he told the people that they should give her two white linen dresses as mata so she did not accept him as her husband and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what did he do he divorced her immediately and we see that there was no idda for her okay so it was only khalwa you understand there was no physical contact it was just that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and her they were alone as soon as he went she said a'udhu billahi mink that's it so this is why some scholars say that although in the quran the word mas has been used must does not necessarily mean sexual intercourse even if the two have been alone that is what understood as masis okay and also we learn from this ayah one more thing that at the time of divorce a man is required to give what to the woman some kind of mata half of the mahr in the case where the mahar was fixed and if the marriage was consummated then how much mahar all of it okay and if the marriage was not consummated mahar was not fixed then what mata we learned this in surah al-baqarah ayah 237 that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa in talaqtumuhunna min qabli an tamassuhunna wa qad faradtum lahunna faridah fa nisfu ma faradtum illa an ya'funa aw ya'fu alladhi bi yadihi uqdatun nikah that if you divorce women before you have touched them and you have already specified for them an obligation then give half of what you specified unless if they forgive or the one in whose hand is the marriage contract forgives it meaning the woman says it's okay i don't want it keep it all with yourself or the man says it's okay i won't keep one half you take all of it you understand both have the right to forgive We also learn from this ayah about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards his servants that he has commanded the men to give some benefit to the women at the time of divorce. Isn't this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy? That this is great comfort for the woman who has been divorced. That obviously she has been emotionally hurt even if there was no physical relationship between the man and the wife. There was still you know the attachment of the name that so and so is now married to so and so and getting divorced at that moment is not something small so it has caused her some emotional turmoil 
Because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His mercy, what has He commanded the men to do? That they must give some kind of matar to the women at this time. Also we learn from the saya about the obligation of tasrih jameel. That when a man lets go of his wife at the time of divorce, then how should he send her? How should he send her? In a beautiful manner, in a gracious manner. Respectfully, not while insulting her. We also learn from this ayah that the idda, idda is the right of the husband. The idda is what? The right of who? The husband, the ex-husband. Where do we learn this from? فَمَا لَكُمْ فَمَا لَكُمْ What does lamb denote? For, possession, that you have the right. Right? So, it shows that the idda is the right of the man. That the woman must sit in idda. She must not get married to anyone until the idda is over. Because this is the right of the man. How is it the right of the man? That he has the right to know if she is carrying his child. Whether it is divorce or it is in the case of death. Right? Although the man has died. But still, his child should get whose name? His name. Even if he has passed away. Then we also learn from this that the men are responsible for keeping count of the idda. Where do we learn that from? فَمَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ عِدَّةٍ تَعْتَدُّونَهَا Who is being addressed over here? The men. Now, a woman, obviously she knows what's going on with her body when she starts her menstrual period and when she ends it. But the man, he has to be extremely careful about this as well. He cannot say, oh yeah, you just let me know when it's over. No. He has to be careful. Because this is his right and he needs to know when the idda is beginning, when it is coming to an end. Even in the case where the talaq is rajri. It's a revocable divorce. Hmm? And the marriage was consummated between the husband and wife. Right? They were living together. The man divorces the woman. It's the first divorce. The woman is living in the house of the husband. Even in that case, who is required to count the idda? The man. The man is required to count the idda. And what is the responsibility of the woman? That she should not lie concerning it. You understand? We have learned earlier. That وَلَا يَكْتُمْنَ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ فِي أَرْحَامِهِنَّ That they should not conceal what Allah has created in their wombs. And all of these rulings, when do they apply? When a man has gotten married to who? A believing woman. And not a kitabi woman. Because a kitabi woman, will she care about the laws of Islam? Obviously not. She will not be concerned about it. So these rulings cannot be enforced on her. Rather, they are to be only in the case where a man gets married to a believing woman. Yes, the hadith that I mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ got married to a woman and she sought refuge with him, that doesn't necessarily prove to us that khalwa is mas. However, this incident has been reported as the reason behind the revelation of this verse. Okay? Because you may wonder that how come this is being mentioned all of a sudden, this ayah? From where? Because these ayahs are not about marriage and divorce. Isn't it so? And all of these rulings have been mentioned earlier. But these ayat, what did they speak about? The marriages of the Prophet ﷺ. In the previous ayat, what was mentioned? The marriage of the Prophet ﷺ with Zainab anha. In the following ayat, more marriages will be mentioned. And this ayah refers to the incident that took place when the Prophet ﷺ got married. However, there was no physical contact. And thus the Prophet ﷺ let her go. Okay? Let's continue.